Emily Oster, welcome to Dialogues. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm very excited for this conversation. Um, as the parent of three now grown kids, uh, I have a lot of interest in your work on evidence-based parenting, but obviously recently around uh, COVID as well. So we'll touch on on all of that, um, especially your kind of recent book. But I, I want to start by asking a bit about your the motivation for your work. You're a highly accomplished economist, and normally what you're supposed to do is choose a lane, preferably a very narrow technical lane, and stay in that lane. Doesn't seem to be your style. So, what motivates no. you? What 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 are you doing? <laughs> what am I doing? It's such a good question. Um, you know, I think um, probably the way I would answer that question would be would have evolved over time. But I think particularly in the last couple of years, I I have realized that the thing that I am that I think that I am good at um, is basically translation. So I think that I that almost everything that I do both in the pregnancy and parenting to some weird extent, actually within my academic work and in the COVID space is about translating something more technical into something that is more understandable. It's a form of teaching, but it's, it's like a more of a written form of, of teaching. And so when I think about the work I do, you know, I did on pregnancy or early Mm -hmm. parenting where it's really saying, okay, let me take this body of, you know, academic literature and kind of help you understand what's good and what's not good about it. Why some papers are better than others and, and sort of bring that to people. And then when I think about the COVID stuff, again, it's the idea of, you know, let's take some, kind of abstract decision tools or some information about data and try to kind of bring it to um, bring it to people. And so I think on the one hand, like you're right, I'm constantly out of my lane topically. I'm just sort of like, I'm constantly out of my lane topically. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it's all in this sort of weird lane that is not really a lane at all, but it is the thing Mm. that I am good at. It's a lane that almost goes the other way. It's not it's defined like a cross, topically. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a skill set thing. And uh, you know, obviously, as someone who works in a in a think tank, and I've spent time in journalism, I think that translation role is is, is underestimated. It feels like you're a, a guy, in a sense, you're a field guide, right? You know, you have the skills to be able to go to the literature, to go to the evidence, and interpret it. And so, what you what it seems to me you do is you do in your parenting work, especially the sorts of literature reviews that an academic would do. But then rather than writing that up for an academic audience, you write that up for a more general audience. And so essentially, they're kind of popular literature reviews is one way to think about it. But but they're they're thorough. But yeah, no, but sometimes I talk about my books as being some combination of memoir and meta analysis. It's sort of and and Mm. some of that is in the back, like, they're actually in in particularly in sort of many of these like more fraught topics. There is a much larger sort of more consistent meta analytic review behind in the research that goes behind it. When I think about it, you know it, surfacing that to people and explaining it, there's a there's a sort of well what like what are the pieces of this that I can pull out and tell people about the specifics of so they will understand the kind of broader picture and what are the considerations in it. And that's that's the translational part that's hard. But it does force you to come to some sorts of conclusions. I think you're very careful about this. But whereas, you know, a good academic response, having done a literature review is this is all very uncertain and we need more research. But because you, you know, more research required is the stereotype. But because you're writing for an audience who actually want to know, you say, look, to the extent that the evidence tells us anything, it tells us this. Right? But that does require you to go a little bit further out on a limb, maybe, than many academics are comfortable being. You have to sort of, you have to call it in the end. You have to say, look, Here's my view. And that's that is that, is that ever something you find difficult? Is that part of your academic training that's trying to pull you back? Yeah, yeah it is. And and I think, you know, it's um it it is hard. It is hard and I think that, you know, part of part of it is part of what makes it possible, I think, or at least I don't know, pushes me to be willing to do that is you know, your realization that in some of these in many of these things, people have to decide. And so as academics, like you know, we we put this information on, but ultimately people have to make some decision and sort of, I can help them make a better decision. It is, it is not as helpful to, to sort of continue to say, oh, we need more data. We need more data. I will say, you know, in the, that, that kind of drawing some conclusion is easier when there is more data. So, you know, we always want more, but there are places where you can be like, okay, I'd like more, but basically like we have enough to say something that, you know, I think is, is, convincing or sort of getting in the direction of like a reasonable person would think there's a good body of evidence on this on this kind of question and then as you know particularly in some of this older kid stuff as I sort of like started thinking more about some of these 
considerations around schools and extracurriculars and the kind of stuff that comes up with older kids, you get to a point where the data is so poor that in a sense, it's not really realistic to be like, okay, this is the answer because like, like, you know, that you, it's, it, it is, there's so little that would move your priors basically. So whatever is your prior is kind of almost also your posterior. And so there, I think I've spent more time, you know, both in, in the last book, but much more so in this book, thinking about how to help people navigate those decisions when the data is kind of uncertain and sort of that, that being a bigger piece of it, um, which I think some people find frustrating because it's like, well, you didn't, you know, like you're just, you're just like being like all the other academics being like, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, but I think it is kind of on the one hand, on the other hand, um, and, you know, your preferences are kind of going to push you to one of the hands. Yeah. And I think what I, what I like about that, and I read it, you know, as a, as a parent, as, as well as, as you know, through a social science lens is I think you're very honest about the quality of the data in different places. But, you know, I also think the huge value here is to myth bust and to make it clear that many of the things that people have come to believe, we just don't know that that's true or not. You have a great example, I think one of your friends who says, we have to have dinner, family dinner, otherwise my kids will become criminals or something. Right. right? Because they'd read yeah. something, and you're like, like, and you're just, you're just like there's, no evidence, there's no there's no there's no causal evidence here at all. We're just like we just so actually, in some ways, I think the myth busting element of it is is valuable because otherwise, every parent thinks every decision they make every day is freighted with this huge consequence. And so, in some ways, it's quite liberating to know that we don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. And so the the family dinner thing is such an interesting thing because I also write in the book like that. That for me, like that's probably after you know kids have to get a lot of sleep. That's probably like the one of the most important pillars of the, the thing that I want to be doing with my family. Mm-hmm. But the reason for that is not because I think my kids will be serial killers, but just because it's really important to me and I like it. And, yes. you know, in some sense, there's a sort of, there's a little bit of a, of a kind of point of like, hey, we spend a lot of time, particularly in sort of certain parenting circles, sort of thinking about all of our choices, needing, wanting all of our choices to be choices that are about making our kid better or, opt, you know, doing something that's the right thing to do. And there's a point of being like, yeah, it's not. It's I, the reason I'm doing this, and the, the reason that this is like so centrally important to me, and I'm making it willing to make a tremendous amount of other choices that allow this to happen, is not because it is important to optimize my kids, but literally just because I enjoy it. And that's yeah, what yeah. It's interesting because I went into the book with a, a bit of a prior, a bit of a prejudice that I was going to find it annoying to the extent that I mean, I love your work, and actually, my brother yeah. said, oh, you've, you've got to interview." So find it useful, but because I have this instinctive reaction against over-professionalizing parenting and this sense of it becoming becoming a profession and so on. But I actually came away with precisely the opposite sense, which is because actually you said, if you this is not about treating your kid as a unit of future human capital and figuring out which longitudinal studies will deliver the best returns on whichever investment. This is about what kind of family do you want to be? Right. No, and exactly. the values, like people right. read it. Right. You say like my book is about, you know, it's about like running your family like a business. People think that means like more use spreadsheets to do more soccer. And in fact, what it means is like use intentional thought to do less soccer or like if that's what you want or to like to give yourself permission or give yourself the capacity to sort of think about how to do less. But I think it is I think it is exactly the opposite in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, and you start with values. Well, let's let's uh, let's actually d- dig into the book, and then I'd like to, if we have time, come back to some of the work you've done on COVID sure. more recently, which you've come semi-famous for. But I, I think we've got um got into the, some of the substance of the book now. And so you have this analogy between a family and a firm, which can create the the sort of reaction that you just referred to. But there are very is very interesting then the analogy you draw and the ways in which families are like firms. And I'd like to take a few of those in turn, if you if you if you'll permit. I think the first one is you talk about strategy. Uh, and I understand what that means to do. So the idea of a family strategy, again, some people are going to feel weird about that. But what it actually boils down to, if I understand your work correctly, is make big decisions to make the small decisions easier. So if you make a big decision that family dinner is easier or this is how we're going to do it, then it means that you're not constantly negotiating. It means you're not having to micro decision all the time. Which like It's like a company mission statement or a company, like this is what this company is about. And so... The decision, the small decision is against that big decision. Is that a fair way to, th- is that the right co- conceptualization? Yeah, I think that's the right conceptualization that we sort of like, if we have, if we have agreed 
that there are some of these big pieces or sort of big decisions that like things that we all think are important and are taking precedence over other things, that's going to automatically determine some of the smaller, some of the smaller decisions and make some of those smaller decisions easier. And, and I would say there's a sort of another part of that, which is that if there are that, making some of those larger decisions together is going to make it easier for many people to implement, to sort of like be the, to almost be the primary parent um, Mm. in any moment. And I think that's, you know, that's again, is sort of like, you would not have a firm in which you would say like one person is the holder of all of the principles of this firm and the firm cannot do anything without that one person. And like, if you sort of said, well, you're just person Sally, and we just never do anything unless we check with Sally first. If Sally's not around, we never, we never, we would never buy anything. We would never make any production decisions. We just would never do anything without checking with Sally. You'd be like, boy, what if Sally's sick? It's like, well, we just don't kind of do anything if Sally's if Sally's not around. We just sort of fl- flail about, and and you'd be like, boy, that sounds like a terrible decision. But I think sometimes we're kind of running our households like that. We're sort of saying like one person is the holder of all of the information. And you can't like decide which shoes to wear without asking that particular person or you can't, you know, and I think we get, there's a, there's a value to recognizing if we can say the things that are important, that can almost take a lot, that can almost take some of that away automatically because they being like, look, there are only like six really important things that we have decided are really central. And so actually everything else, it's kind of not that important. And so anyone should be able to make those decisions because they're not that central. Yeah, I, I like that, especially as we're doing a lot more co-parenting now. I think as we've moved into a situation where we are, we're doing more parenting, I do know I noticed that even among my own sort of peers that some there are some couples who need to negotiate absolutely everything, right? And it's all oh, we'll have to talk to your mum about that, we we'll have to talk to your dad about that, and everything has to be co-decided, which is incredibly inefficient. And I think what you're saying is no. You, you have an example, I think, wasn't there? Some one of your kids there was the op- opportunity to do some extracurricular thing, but it conflicted with something else. And it was just like nobody had to talk. It was like so my daughter had there was a there was a running club, but it was met at six and we ate dinner at six and that was it. And so it was just like we didn't have to co-parent. We didn't have to discuss it. We didn't have to bring it up. It was just like that's not, you know, we're not going to we're not going to do that. And I think sort of similarly, like, you know, I was I was out of town the other day and uh, and, you know, we have some vague guy you know sort of things that are typical i would say around like when we have dinner and when like what how frequently you're allowed to have ice cream for dessert like things like that but many of those things are kind of unimportant the sort of really central important stuff in our house is like that you go to bed that you like eat dinner at around six and you go to bed at you know 7 30 and you know when i'm when i was gone i think you know things <laughs> There was ice cream at the wrong time. Bath was shorter. The reading happened in a different way, you know. And, and of course, it, it is befitting of how structured my family is that my six-year-old sent me some emails that were like, "Mom, Dad, let me. Dad doesn't know the rules. He let me have ice cream <laughs> after dinner." You know, it's like that's but you know that's and uh, but the thing is that like then he was in you know like he was in bed at the right time and so you just sort of like and there was we didn't have to talk about that we didn't have to check it was just we understood like that you know that's the only the only kind of really central thing and everything else a little flexible but if you don't if you don't have rules then you can't bend them occasionally and then there's no fun in it right the, and then there's the, no fun the, exactly the, i mean where, he like the joy that came from the like extra day of ice cream and then when I got home, he was like, he let, it was a whole ice cream bar. And I was like, oh, my God, that's terrible. <laughs> yes, exactly. If that's the, the, the furthest off the rails, your kids are going to go. I know. Them. It's like, pretty, <laughs> I mean, but think about the joy that's brought by that extra ice cream bar. Uh, exactly. I mean, we've had a few similar experiences kind of raising our own kids. One was um, when actually one of, so one of my goals we'll come on to goals in a minute, but set clear and explicit goals. My goals were, I have three sons, and one of my goals was going to be that they would be good at, very good at foosball, uh, table football, as we call it in the UK, and, and very good at pool, right? And they are all very good at those things. So I think they're great life skills. And we had this foosball table, and my kids were probably, I was doing most of the care, and my kids were, I don't know, six and eight or something. And I said to them, if you beat me five games in a row, then you can put me to bed rather than me putting you to bed. And I, 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 honestly, I've been beating them the whole, there was no chance of them. Of course, they then played better than they've ever played before and beat me five games in a row. They then put me to bed. So my wife arrives home from work 
to find to find the kids still up watching TV. And you're and- asleep. And I'm in bed. I mean, I wasn't asleep. I was, I was lying there. But she's like, "Where's dad?" And they said, "Ah, oh, we got to put him to bed." And and like, what we're talking about here is just like eight p.m. or something. Right? Yeah, exactly. It, was like, no, right, no, right. it wasn't like two a.m. or something. Right? It was. They, they ended up going to bed like an hour later than usual or something like that. But they still talk about that day. And so it's an example of just occasionally you you they you knew that because like we were yeah, just a little bit to have some some kind of fun fun with it, right? Um, so I do li- I like all of that. And I so I think making micro decisions easier by having the macro mission, that's a clear thing. Companies do it well. And actually just having the conversation, being intentional about what's important to us as a family, what are the negotiables? I think that's that's like that's the foundation of this work, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. And I you know, I think one of the things that that, that one of the sort of issues that raised when we talk about co parenting is that when you have some of those co- the conversations, they are going to surface disagreements. And I think this is a thing that's sort of hard when you are in a relationship with somebody because we do not want to purposely. We're like, we are even the most, even people who are not super conflict averse, the idea of sort of sitting down and like surfacing on purpose ways in which we disagree is, is difficult you know is not something people like to do but i think there's a there's a sort of argument for like well you're you're going to be surface those are going to get surfaced right so you're like it's not that you're that you're going to get away with having some central like disagreement about your values and never learning about it you know you're just going to learn about it at probably a less convenient time and so i think there's a little bit of a pitch there for you know sort of a, a point that like actually there's some value to 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 at least at least saying what those disagreements are Yes, yeah, you know, yeah, and possible. rather than maybe acting them out, I think a little bit exactly so that, rather than acting them out in a passive aggressive manner. Yes, as we, when, when, as we do, we have a tendency to do uh, as we as, like to do <laughs> occasionally. But your but your approach is better, and so that was so. Number two is to set really to be clear and explicit about the goals. Right, what are, what are the goals of the family? And you, you examples around dinner and bedtime. Are, are there others that you found useful? Are, are there in your own life, family life? It's really by clarifying the goal that's made life easier. You know, I think that there's, um, you know, there's a, this is a little bit more nebulous because it's not like a, a thing, you know, I tend to be a pretty concrete person. And so a lot of like the way I would organize how I think about my goals is to say like, what do I want to be doing? Because that's of course then influencing. But I think the one sort of more nebulous stuff for us is the question of like, of kind of like how much independence do we want to be, like how much do we want to be thinking about independence as a goal? Um, and that is that sort of that that goal is important because I think it scaffolds some of what we expect of our kids and how we organize like res- almost responsibilities. Um, so you know, are you the, the the way I put it in the book is sort of like helicopter parenting versus free range parenting, where I think you know I don't really like the idea of labels, but I think there's there's something inside that about you know who's responsible for putting the homework in the backpack, and is that something that I'm doing or is it something I'm expecting you to do and the recognition if it's I'm not you you my spouse my partner but you my kid and if I am expecting you my kid to be responsible for those things you know how much am I willing to let you kind of mess up and that's a I I I think that is not um always so obvious I, I think really very reasonable people differ in how they are how much of that they want to be doing like how, just how much freedom and responsibility they want to give their kids but it is also something where it's going to influence a lot of the of the the decisions or the ways that you interact and so it is it is an important thing to talk about yeah I agree and also it's it's one of the things where it's as much about probably the timing I think most parents would say I want my I want my kids to grow up to be independent adults, uh, able to you know organize themselves, organize their finances, you know, travel confident, etc. But they might, you know, some of us would say I definitely taught, tend towards the earlier age on this. Some would say I'd like them to be able to do that stuff when they're fourteen or sixteen, and then other parents are like, no, I think twenty two, right? Maybe it was eighteen, and now it's twenty two. I have friends who are like still still figuring out bank account problems for their twenty one year olds, and I'm like. I, I, you know just so and and maybe that's maybe that's fine i don't know but again absent clear evidence it's just a values thing really it's just like where where do you dis, where do you uh where do you land on the independence point because that is quite a fraught issue for parents right now i think i think it is and i think it is it, you know it, you could sort of say well like i'm going to think about that later when they are 14 or 16 or whatever but i think what's hard is that um that's actually a very hard set of things to introduce when the stakes seem higher Right. So the sort of example I talk about in the book is like, okay, so, you know, I, 
if you tell your kid you're responsible for getting your homework in your backpack and they're 10 year, you know, and you say, well, I really think they should be responsible for that at 17. Like 17 feels like by then, you know, by the time they go off to college, like I think that they should be able to like get their, you know, pan their problem sets in on time, whatever. If you introduce that at 17, like senior, you know, senior mm-hmm. year of, of high school in the fall, you're like, okay, new rule. You're, I've, I've always been making sure it's in your backpack, but this year you're going to make sure it's in your backpack. Like you're, you're going to have trouble following through on that because it's going to be like, boy, this is actually a really important assignment that they forgot. Whereas mm-hmm. if you sort of back that up and you say, okay, I'm going to make you responsible for that when you're 10, then when they forget their homework, which they will because they're kids and they're going to forget it, then the worst thing that happens is, you know, they forgot their homework in fifth grade and that, and the stakes there seem much lower. And so I think that's where the sort of independence the, – the, the independence piece is worth thinking about in this younger age group because – it is something that one is going to have to build piece by piece and because the stakes are simply much lower on a lot of these pieces when they're little. How do you think about kids who have diff- difficulties? So I'm just speaking from personal experience. If you have you know, a, a strong orientation towards independence and learning quickly, but then it turns out that one, you know, one of your kids has really genuinely terrible ADD. Um, and so you have these horrible, horrible fights, tearful things, not being able to get their stuff together in the morning. No, no one kid, I like, I, I was like, I would pretend to drive away to school because I was so frustrated, you know, and he's in tears and I'm furious and so on. And then it turns out that you just, you just, even today, it really struggles with that. So how do you think about calibrating some of these goals to the specifics of kids, especially when the kids differ, right? When they're so different within a household, you've got one who just literally can't remember anything, barely remember to put their socks on one day, and another one who's kind of game on two years earlier. Yeah, no, I mean, I think this is the, you know, I mean, this, this is the ultimate challenge of, of parenting. And this is the, and I think it is also, a, you know, the, it is an, it is the argument for recognizing the heterogeneity across kids. And that, you know, what, what is kind of, I think kind of for those of us who have, have multiple kids, you know, particularly if the first one is like easy, it's easy to be like, oh, the reason for that is because of my amazing parenting, you know, and then you can <laughs> you, like get to the second one. You're like, well, I guess my parent, like, I guess, you know, and I, I think that we, um, we, you know, we, we naturally form our expectations about our kids based on the, the experiences that we've had so far. And it can be, um, it can be. I think particularly challenging to like embrace the embrace the the ways in which our kids are are different and sort of think about setting those goals whatever is the goal setting mm-hmm. them in a way that is thoughtful about what that kid can accomplish right yes. so you know like just I, almost like I like I would like you to be here that's what I but like the thing is like y- you can only do one step at a time and maybe that step you know maybe the, that step is smaller um yeah I don't that's know. a I mean, good way to think is, about it yeah, yeah. That's a good way to think about. It. I think you know, also if the goal is independence, then you can become independent in different ways. So you have the kid that can't put their socks on and has never turned in homework, but they can uh, become so good at tech that they become they they fix your family's Wi-Fi at the age of twelve, right? Somebody Whatever. else get their socks. Yeah, exa- exactly. It's like I'll get your socks if you fix the Wi-Fi. If then you fix deal. the Wi-Fi, <laughs> then you've got a deal. So. I think the other thing you do um, that I think is compatible with the idea of companies and economics more generally is to make visible trade-offs. And in particular, there's a, the opportunity costs. So I think there's, there's good stuff here on opportunity costs, counterfactuals, risk assessment, stuff that companies and kind of economists think about quite a lot. And I, I'm particularly struck to, to start with this idea of opportunity cost. I don't think that many parents would necessarily think about that. Um, but you're very clear about the fact that you know, there's a cost, there's an opportunity cost. So talk a bit about the concept of opportunity cost um, and how that could apply to parenting decisions. Yeah, so, the, so the concept of the opportunity cost is just, you know, that, that when, you, when you do an activity or you do something or, you know, in economics, more like you spend money on something, but like whatever it is you're, you're doing, you are not doing something else. And so there is a sort of inherent trade-off in all of the choices that we are making about, particularly in this case, is you know, how we spend our time. The, there is an, there is a trade-off where you where like if you're spending your time on one thing, you're not spending it on uh, you're not spending it on on another thing. And so I think that th- the reason that that concept I think is is helpful is because it makes very obvious the the sort of t- the trade-off the the fact that there are that no no decision is like nothing that you're doing is is free right that that you know if you have your kid do 
another hour of something, that's something that that's an hour they can't do. That's an hour of sleep or something, right? So I think I talk about this a lot in the con- the sort of hmm. these kind of trade offs come up all the time in the concept in the content of you know in the context of sleep, where I think we tend to under I think we tend to undervalue that. Um, but also we have to recognize, you know, if you were going to decide that sleep is important and that your kid needs to sleep a lot and they need to be in bed early, there are going to be things they can't do. There's an opportunity cost associated with that because you can't do nighttime activities if you need to be need to be in bed. And I think, you know, for me, that concept has always been really helpful in just crystallizing the the kind of everything has a cost and a, and a benefit, even if it seems like yeah. it's free. It's not free. Yeah, because time, yes, not least in terms of time. And I strongly agree with you about sleep. And I, perhaps we'll talk a bit more about that. The other thing I think you do is, you, I think relatedly, is kind of run counterfactuals and say, well, what's, what's the, what are the alternatives here? Rather than just more is always better. Um, and, I, and I think about risk as well. I think this is back a bit to the free range independence thing, too, which is as we're making decisions, is to think, think uh, uh, quite logically in an evidence based way about risk because i think there is a view of parenting which is just the less risk the better and i think what you're encouraging us to do is just to be more risk aware is that fair and are there are good exa- i mean i can think of examples from my own parenting but what are the examples that that, that you would draw on yeah i, I mean i think it's exactly it's exactly the examples i would draw on i think are in this sort of space of of independence you know i think we're very reluctant to let kids have physical independence much more so than when we were um than when i was a kid um, and because of this sort of like, because we have become hypersensitive to, to risks. So to like, you know, physical risks. So if I let my kid, you know, walk home from school, they, you know, which is a thing, which as I, as a kid, I did across mm-hmm. many large streets at a very young age, um, and was completely not bad at an eye at, you know, I think now that is just much less common and and if you sort of asked why and you sort of push people on like what are you afraid of you know the answer is like child snatching or something you know there's like at, 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 and in some ways that that's such a clear example of of kind of people making risk mistakes because people will tell you well i'm worried that my kid will be kidnapped and say well actually the the thing you should be worried about is that they're getting hit by a car which is mm. also really unlikely but is like infinitely more likely than they they will be kidnapped on their on the way home you know just in terms of like how large are these risks and i think part of Part of what's hard to conceptualize, and I've spent so much time on this in the COVID space, is is it's just when a risk is salient, it gets in our head very large. And I think that's because we struggle with small probabilities that once we're thinking about the risk, it kind of like takes on a higher probability. And And there are a lot of everyday risks we never think about. You know, we don't think really about the driving risks or, you know. Or just a like background risk of st- bad stuff that that happens. We don't really think about that when there is a salient risk in our head. It's driving our our decisions. I think more than it it often should. And that and fear rules a lot with kids. And and there's a sort of a, a way to kind of try to force people a little bit to step out and be like, okay, actually, you need to conceptualize this risk in a more you know direct way and try to make a decision that makes sense. Yes, and and I think also highlight the risks on the other side, even though they're much less tangible. So you get you know the tangible risk of you know, abduction or you know being hit by a car versus well, and the parent might say, well, what's the risk of me walking them to school? What's the risk of me not letting them kind of walk? It, there's no risk. It's, well, actually, there are risks. There, there are risks that they become less physically healthy, that they don't develop the skills to be able to deal with an emergency, and so. But those all seem quite soft and diffuse as opposed to the the sharp risk of something really horrible happening. And so it's quite yeah. it's it's hard for the reasons you identify. Yeah, and I think and I think we also, you know, tend to to sort of under undervalue benefits in those, you know, and sort of and and all, again sort of saying like well, like what if your kid wants to? Like that's something that we should like that should have some that, like what if they would like it? Like that's something that we should value and we're very I think we're sort of in some ways very reluctant to say, well, I like I'm doing that. Like the reason I am having my kid do that is because they they said they wanted to and it seemed like it would be f- fun. Yeah. Well, you, the, you're because you're giving them some agency as well. You're not again. Right. You're not just treating them as a unit of either human capital or risk assessment, but a passive a passive counter in the sort of game uh, of parenting example. But I do think it's it's useful 
So if our previous generation, so my parents, my parents probably just didn't think about it uh, when we walked home or we went off and played in the woods on our own or stuff because they didn't have the strange danger abduction thing. And in the UK in particular, there was a very famous case of an abduction, Jamie Bulger, which because it was caught on video, on CCTV and repeatedly put on every news channel, every parent had that in ble- you know, literally etched on yeah, their we had retina. had a couple of those here too. And, and, and actually, you, and what happened was you did, Geographers and sociologists then literally showed how the map shrank of of kids, how far kids were allowed to go on their own after these incidents, just because, as you said, they become salient. But on the other hand, I do sort of think being aware of the risks, and I think road deaths is a good example. So our kids, we're, on a, we're living on a very, very small street, very little traffic, knew all our neighbors, and we decided to let our kids walk up and down the street, we'll go to their neighbors, right? And they were very young. Um, but I do remember my wife and I having a conversation, which is there is a small risk that because we do this, they get hit by a car, right? And we have to just look each other in the eye and say, that's okay. We, we will take that very, very small risk because we think the benefits outweigh them. But we have to be, we have to be, because then if we do get hit by a car, we will, we will know, we won't be like, oh my God, we never imagined that could happen, right? We knew that there was a small chance of that. So it's a bit about not saying there is no risk. It's about, honestly, I think it's about being able to live with yourself. Because if something bad does happen, because you've because you've been thoughtful about the risks, yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And and you know, thinking about what are the, um, you know, are there are there ways to make yourself sort of like make the right decision in spite of those of those risks? And I think it's 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 just very hard because I think it becomes it just it's just very hard. We don't like to you know those those sort of those things seem infinitely costly, and I think that's that's what's that's what's hard. And if other parents would feel differently, yeah. Um, the other thing I think I really like is, and again, I think there's another element where it's similar to a business, if you like, but but it's, what it's really just about is good decision making, right? Um, and you have you have this really nice thing about how you make decisions. You have the four Fs. So when you're making a decision, so you know when to take which school, which phone, which you know when can they go out, what's their curfew or whatever. Um, and the four Fs are: you frame the frame it question, you fact find go get the evidence, you make a final decision, and then later on you do a follow-up. Very useful, I think. I have to say, as a kind of parent, um, very, very helpful. But the framing one uh, is particularly interesting to me because I, I do think that that's quite often where things can go wrong, not just in parenting more generally, if you misframe the question. And I think you have some quite good examples. Can you give an ex- where, in, either from your own life or from your work, where a question can be framed inappropriately or less helpfully maybe? So I think that, you know, the biggest kind of issue I think people have when they're framing questions wrong is to frame them as option one or class of other things. So people say, you know, should I, I mean, this came up all the time with COVID, should I send my kid back to daycare or not? Mm -hmm. Well, or not is not a childcare solution for you, you know, and, and so, and we, and we see, I think we see that framing all, all the time because we're often making a decision where we have like one thing we're thinking about and then we have some idea behind it that there's a default and, you know, sometimes there is, right? So you sort of say like, you know, should I send my kid to this sleepaway camp or not? You Maybe you kind of understand what that or not is, but I still think that there's a huge amount of value to sort of being very explicit about a small number of of options and that we we kind of every Mm -hmm. that the the framing problems really arise when we are actually only considering one option against some nebulous default which we haven't actually said what it is because then it's then it and it actually intersects with some of these risky things because if you're sort of thinking about uh something where there's a risk some some type of physical or you know or other risk to the, the other thing then inevitably or not is something we we conceptualize as having no risk when in fact or not may have all the same risks that doing this this has but if we haven't said what it is then we can't kind of evaluate those and so i think that in the framing the question that's the that's the biggest mm. Mm. pitfall it's a binary it's, it's like summer camp or not whereas it could be summer camp or we could send to day camps and spend some time together in the evenings and then we could get their grandmother to look after them you know and, and they could do this or they could go to this other or they could just stay home and we could or, or i could take some time off and then you could take or you know what so making you're basically you're trying to make a sort of plurality rather than a binary and say that it's a range of options rather than or yeah not. or at least that that we have said what is in the other op- like even if it is just two options it's two concrete options right it's two right. specific options not one specific option and a large number of other things in some pit of of otherness 
that we can't actually say anything about what is it what is that yeah yeah well let's put some of these ideas to work on some specific areas which is exactly what you do in the book and and more generally and um start with some of the evidence around extracurricular uh, activities so that's a, a very hot button issue especially among upper middle class parents um you know they, they've got to be scheduled they've got to do a whole you know bunch of stuff i have to say that you know in our parenting one of our biggest one of our biggest hopes for our kids is they never got good enough for anything to be on a travel team we sort of lived in fear that one of them was going to come home and say i made the travel team because we're like oh my god that's our weekend's gone because actually our we are one of our we weren't as explicit about it as I think we would have been if we'd read your work. But one of our values was that we, we need our weekends to have time together as a family and to recover from the busy weeks. And so we are not going to be driving all over the country. To uh, Unfortunately, we just we got away with it. One of them was briefly on a soccer travel team, but it didn't last very long, thank goodness. Um, but it wasn't because of us stopping it. So, but there is this whole thing, right? It's this mania for extracurricular. Yeah. And, and I, I read your work as to say the evidence that extracurricular activities – end up you know making your kids you know doubly awesome anything i just it's thin very very thin and smoke and if there is anything it's selection rather than anything else is that fair yeah i think that's absolutely fair that that you know um this sort of pre-professionalization and the idea that somehow like more is more is better or like if you know if kids do a lot of music they're gonna that's gonna mean that they're good at math and they do all kind of other things or you know if they do a lot of sports they're gonna be like amazing athletes and they'll be recruited like this all of this stuff is just like that is not that is not showing up what's what I find interesting sort of what does show up when we look at like is there value to extracurriculars is that there there does seem to be some value but it's basically delivered in kind of a sort of socio-emotional sense Mm -hmm. that like you know having some other you know for for at least some kids sort of having some other peer group outside of say their primary school peer group uh has these these benefits but that is delivered you know in some of these studies by like a very small amount of you know there's a study in in Scandinavian Scandinavian country in which they introduced some extracurriculars like into the school day so it was you know doing a half hour here half an hour there but like kids got to pick what they were doing it was like a different peer group actually has some like quite good impacts on you know on on kind of mental health stuff but it's not that they are in it's not a travel soccer team it's like a school club basically and so I think that's um you know that that has organized I hadn't sort of thought about extracurriculars in that way before I did the book. And I think that has organized a lot of how I think about this with my kids. And so, you know, that, that it's not that we're having them do these things because, you know, I don't have my kids play the violin because they're going to be first chair at, you know, in the, in the like New York Philharmonic, I have them, you know, do it because I, I think that there's some chance that that's going to be a good like social group for them at, you know, at some point, when inevitably middle school occurs yeah i actually i like the way you write about that um and the danger is i like it because it it fits with my priors fits in your prior sure i mean yeah i also don't do anything on the weekends we also have like no weekend plans right we also have to be careful about that that reading as you as you point out that you have to be careful when it conform you know conforms with your priors but but i think this idea of having a sort of plurality of social networks in some senses are more of a sort of balanced portfolio socially um and you just you say that you say something that i think i had thought and felt but not actually articulated before i read your work so for example you know i ran a scout group for young kids for a while and i did some of that myself but i, I did a bunch of stuff i did loads of extracurricular stuff growing up but i was pretty terrible at all of it and, and i didn't stick with a lot of it for long but but when i thought thought about actually being a scout leader what i realized was that there were kids in that group who were having a really tough time at school but then would come and flourish on there's you know th- and, uh, the scout camp right and, and vice versa so it just it gave you an escape valve it means like if like if you just got one social network um i think you're right there's a day so just an escape i mean you have different friends it's, but honestly i think it boils down to you have a slightly different friendship network you have different people to go to so that if things are shit on that front then it might be a bit better on that front it's it's just man- managing risk so i think that honestly think that's the main advantage I, th- I think so too. And I think, and I think, you know, if we recognize that our, our approach to extracurriculars is like in some ways a lot more relaxed because it's like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm sort of looking and it is also, it's more relaxed and it also is more kid driven. So there's a sense in which like, you know, this is an argument for like, should the extracurricular should be something your kid likes because like have it, you know, and I, I had one conversation about some, about the book with somebody and they were sort of explaining to me 
that like in California, there's a lot of push for people to have their kids do crew, um, like rowing, uh, mm -hmm. because Ivy League schools like to have rowers from California. And that struck me as like, that's sort of like the, that's the opposite. Like that, you know, first of all, I, I don't know. That just seems very stressful. But also like that's, that isn't, you know, if your kid doesn't like to row crew, having them row crew, because like, you know, like last year, Harvard took some, you know, guy from San Diego for their crew team. Like that's, that is not the, the that's not what we're, which we should be delivering uh, with extracurriculars. That's kind of not, that's, that's not where the data is. No, no. Although actually you do kind of, you say at one point, um, when you talk about extracurricular, what are the motivations for people? Uh, and you go through the various motivations and then you, you, I think you bust most of the myths, but there was one point where you said one of the motivations is around college admissions, which you've just referred yeah. to. And you say college admission, th that, that motivation quotes explains itself. Um, and actually it was one of the broader points I wanted to ask you, and it's perhaps a good time to ask you this, which is the extent to which some of, some of the behaviors that parents have is obviously affected by the market that they, they face. And so if even to some small degree, college admissions is affected by extracurricular, then it's perhaps not surprising that parents respond to those incentives. Now they might be getting the, the math wrong, right? The chances of your kid getting into Harvard because of crew might be one in, you know, 10 you know 10 billion as opposed to one whatever but but it but it but it's pl but it makes sense whereas if you have a college admission system like the one i'm used to in the uk where your athletic prowess has literally zero impact on your admissions and it takes the pressure off and so i guess a, a potential criticism of your work is that you're helping parents to kind of navigate a, a system that's broken itself right that, that that we should fix college admissions right and then parents won't yeah start responding to those crazy and then they wouldn't need you to tell us it's crazy because the system wouldn't be demanding it. No, I, I think that's a, that's a fair point. The other place I think that comes up a lot, I've been thinking a lot about in last, you know, it's sort of particularly in act, interaction with people about the book is, so I talk some about this phenomenon in the U S where people like enter their kids to school late because like sort of a year late, because it kind of like the idea is like, it, it, well, there are various motivations, but some of them are in the same space of kind of like your kid will be smarter and bigger and more successful in various ways. And, um, and there's, you know, some research around reasons why you might want to do that or not, which I, which I talked through, but I think there's an underlying thing there, which is actually, it's kind of a terrible idea to give that we're giving parents this choice at all, except in very unusual, you know, I mean, there are sort of very unusual situations where a kid is really not, you know, like really not ready, but we're now talking about a case where like a pretty large share of summer kids with a summer birthday in the U.S. are entering school a year after the sort of typical time. There's a huge amount of demographic heterogeneity in that it's basically only an option that's being taken up by, you know, people with a lot of resources. And it it isn't, it is exacerbating inequality. It's, it's you know, changing the, the the structure of these classes, it shouldn't really be something we're giving people an option to do. And so, you know, I'm kind of writing about like how people can optimize that option. But in fact, the 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 sort of policy point here is like we just shouldn't have that anymore. Like we right. have the option to to redshirt. And I think part of what's hard is well once you have the option as a parent, then you kind of want to operate inside the constraints that we're given. Even even if you thought we shouldn't have that option, you still want to make the right choice for your kid. And I think that's I think that's that's a tension that many of us struggle with is like, I want the world to be different, but also I definitely want to make the right choice for my kid. Yeah, I think that's that's really the point I'm making is that there are really some difficult normative issues here around a lot of this. Like school choice, for example, is, is another yes. one maybe where um, what people are saying it, it's saying is effectively, I wish the world wasn't like this. But given that it, it is, is like this, I'm going. I'm yeah. I'm. Yeah. This is how I'm going to play the game. But but I, I'm I'm glad you talked a bit about that because I I think sometimes that's a different level of moral dilemma that we face. Right. This is not just a kind of internal issue. It's a uh, how far do I want to use my skills? And I've I've read Emily's book, so I know what the best thing is to, to in a system that's fundamentally un, unfair. So you basically help people to navigate an unfair system more effectively. And how far do I want to not contribute to that system? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it is, I mean, I think it's particularly hard when it's our kids, you know, I think that there's, I mean, and you see this all the time, you know, like, like if I live in it, like I live in a, uh, I live in a public school, I live 
physically in a public school district that is very troubled. Like, you know, it has been, there's a state takeover, the test scores are terrible, you know, the sort of public school, and my, so my kids go to private school. And, you know, I think that in many, for many people, this, I mean, for me too, there's a sort of tension of like, I would like, I would like it to be the case that the public school system was great. But I also like, I, I have to, you know, I'm, I'm ultimately feel like I need to make the choice that is, that is the right choice for my, for my kids. That is like the, you know, because I'm, so, Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I think there's an easy answer to this. And I I think I feel it a, a lot in, in kind of writing for, yeah, writing for the, in this way. Yeah, well, all my I've done a little bit of work in this space, particularly comparing the UK and the US. And I think my only my only observation is that it's better when people wrestle with these dilemmas and recognize yeah. that there is a dilemma. Um, there was a, a book Adam Swift wrote in the UK, which was called, uh, it was something like How to Choose Your School, A Guide for the Morally Perplexed. And it was really about this very, this exactly issue. And yeah. what I thought was great, because actually, because there, there is, and you have, if you're, if you're liberal, in your political inclinations in the UK and you send your kid to a private school, private K-12 school, you have some explaining to do around the dinner table, right? You, you need to get, you need to get ready for some social stigma, right? Um, you know, I, the, the fact, for example, if you're a UK prime minister, you can't send your kids to a private school, for example. David Cameron had to take his kids out, make sure his kids were in a government school. And the, the, yeah. one of the first things he did when he left office was to put his kids back into a private school because you couldn't possibly run the country and have your kids in a private school. Right? Whereas in the US, of course, every president sends a That's kid. all, yeah. <laughs> right. So I guess it's only, I just, just making salient the, the fact that there are, there are trade-offs. And I think more generally, there's almost like, there's a, I'd like to you know, write a, a shadow book almost to yours, which says, okay, here's what you should do around college admissions and so on, given the current system but by, by the way here's, here's how you what the system, the system. Be. right um here's how you make sure your kid gets enough sleep but here's why school should actually start later so that your kids can get more sleep without having to go to bed so early which is kind of ridiculous here's how to juggle work and kind of family life but here's how we should reform the workplace so to take the kind of pressure off kind of period so there's a, that you could almost take all you take all these things where yeah. and then say okay but how as a matter of public policy could we make this stuff a bit easier for families? So I think you're doing the bit. It's like, given where we are, how do we navigate it? There's a there's a supplementary piece of work which would be to say, how do we make a lot of that stuff yeah. easier? No, it's it's super interesting. I mean, I actually been thinking about this in the COVID stuff also because basically I've been writing. So I've been doing a lot of this COVID work and writing for parents about kind of how. And much of my writing is about like, how as a parent do I make a choice in the constrained environment that I find myself in, right? So like we're opening schools, people want to know, should I send my kid back? And there's like a completely separate debate about, you know, in what way should schools be open? What mitigation should we be doing? Like, what should we be doing about schools? But for parents, it's like, okay, my school is opening in whatever way it's opening. And the choice, only choice I have is whether to send them or not. And so we're like making choices there's mm-hmm. a constrained set of choices that parents are facing, and that discussion is sort of very separate. can can be separate, although is very overlapping with like what should our societal policies be. Yes, your your agenda is really around private policy as opposed to public policy um, and how they interact. But actually, the COVID stuff and let's 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 swerve into that a little bit um, because you've kind of raised it, which is obviously becomes more public policy relevant. So there is the question of you know what do we what do we do. Um, uh, as a matter of public policy and then that's how do you respond as parents but you've you've really been drawn into this uh as a as a debate and actually it's quite it's interesting quite timely there's a there was this i don't know if you've seen it this video has gone viral of these people protesting outside a school board in franklin tennessee when the school board voted to say there should be masks and so on and as they came out they were just assaulted and people say like we know where you live and uh, and it was it, honestly it was one of those re- don't watch it and anybody listening to this don't don't watch it if you want to feel good about about America don't watch it it's horrible this stuff's got quite very 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 freighted and it's not and it's not over yet you know one might think that at this point it'll be over so just back up a little bit and say given everything else you were trying to do how did you get drawn into this uh, work and, and where and where is your thinking now about how we should be thinking about schools education COVID and risks yeah so I mean I got drawn into it I, I mean I really would say it was accidental I sort of got very frustrated with and with the fact that we were not collecting data on this. And, and, you know, I had a little bit of a platform through the newsletter. I sort of connected to some people doing more official school stuff. We ended up like creating this dashboard, which had a fair amount of data. 
and, you know, was really, I, I think, certainly it is not the best data that we have on schools on this sort of the, the with the argument supporting the argument that schools could reopen safely but it was the first and i think mm-hmm. we ended up with a fair amount of of sort of attention and so on by basically coming out and saying you know in october schools can open without being massive locations of covid a conclusion which everyone else came to you know like in all mm-hmm. the sort of like official people came to like in december you know and so it was sort of i think we we <laughs> we were we were on the on the beginning of that because that you know i think i think we felt like the data that we were getting on that it made that mm-hmm. made that clear um and uh and so i think you know i think by the end of the year it's sort of pretty clear that there are ways that we like that operating in sc- schools full in person it can be done safely i think that's extremely clear and uh, that in-person learning is really important for kids and that if kids are not in school, that's extremely bad for their mental health, for their learning, for kind of everything else. It's like a very poor thing. We should not – that was that was really bad. It was w- way worse than people thought it would be yes. um, is kind of how I would organize those those findings. And so, you know, I think we now find ourselves in a position where kind of everyone is – there. there is broader agreement that we should uh, – that schools should be open and having in-person – school be available i think there is less agreement on whether we should force people into in-person school uh and then there's like obviously much less agreement on some of these mitigation factors um and so you know we're kind of we've arrived at like a little bit of a different place part of what's so frustrating for me is we're actually at the same place in terms of our data so Mm -hmm. you know we were kind of (laughs) like we started doing this last summer because there was no systematic data collection We're not doing it again, but there's still no systematic data collection. And so we're still, you know, kind of in the same, you know, data poor environment, which is, which I think is, is makes, is part of what is making all of these questions about things like mitigation really hard to answer because we, we just don't like, kind of just don't know. Mm. Yeah. There's a few things that strike me about your work in that area. And I'd like to thank you for your work in that area. Um, Because, because as you say, someone had to do it and it turned out uh, to be, you, but I think it, it, it echoes a little bit of this conversation we had earlier about different kind of risks and the salience of risks and how do you how do you manage a kind of a, you know very salient, very scary thing, COVID pandemic, etc. With how do you manage? How do you think about the risk of the loss of learning, especially to more disadvantaged kids? Actually, over months and months, and that feels like this very opaque. Who knows? They can zoom in. It's just school. You know, stuff. And I think you were one of the leading voices, and I, and I don't, th- and I think you've suffered some attacks as a result of this. Of saying, look, the risk on the other side of screwing up, the derailing the education of you know these kids is big, and you've got to balance the two risks carefully. Whereas that risk wasn't didn't, and even now it feels like there's a lot of difference across school districts and become quite political as well, almost like a sign of. I gave that horrible example from the video, but actually, even more generally, it feels like there's a something of a political divide here about where you stand on it rather than an evidence-based divide. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it was, you know, the political divide has been through, has been there the whole time, right? So the sort of last summer that Trump said, you know, schools should open and, and immediately that meant basically schools open on political lines, not on, you know, not on science lines more or less. And I think that, that has, has kind of con- continued. Um, yeah. That, that sort of divide has, uh, has, has continued through and it's mm-hmm. and it's true in the masks and it's true in all of these other um you know and all of these other things and i you know i think in terms of the impacts on on kids part of what was hard about this is that the learning losses i think feel to people fixable i don't think that they are I, or i think that mm-hmm. you know they are not are in quite in the same way but i also think that what people missed is that's probably the tip of the iceberg like the fact that you know a bunch of like that you know kids are are behind in math like you know it's not that we are going to fix that but we could it is possible to uh it is possible to fix that the thing that uh the thing that is that is going to be hard or impossible to fix are some of these, you know, mental health things, the fact that some kids are just gone from the school, like kids, you know, they're going to be kids who just like dropped out and don't come back to high school. They don't finish high school. That's like a very long-term thing. And I think the thing that, that has, that pushed me so hard on this in some sense, when I sort of reflect on it is last spring, you know, our kids were my kids. So my kids were 
were in school this last year, but in the spring of 2020, like everybody else, they were not in school. And I, I realized that, you know, they, they learned a lot. Like they, you know, like I, like they learned a lot. Like I, my five-year-old learned to read, you know, my daughter, like, like I, you know, we like, uh, we're like two academics with a tremendous amount of resources. Scaffolding the learning was not hard. And I'm not saying anyone could do that. Like, I think that was, you know, but that was sort of particular, like that, that was for us, that part wasn't hard, but it was terrible. And it was terrible because they missed all the other things about school, because actually school was delivering a huge amount of other stuff even to people with tremendous resources, there were huge gaps. And then when you sort of take the next step and you be like, okay, actually, we're doing this to people with very limited resources where they don't have a parent they're watching over, where the 10-year-old is like trying to be on the Zoom class and watch their younger siblings at the same time because their parents are essential workers. Like we are really, really doing a very bad thing to to kids. And I think that that, that got – we sort of got into like, well, how can we measure the learning losses when in fact the learning losses were sort of like are like a tiny fraction of the problem. Yes, and I think some people have measured the learning losses, but you're right. There are there are I mean we've had student losses. There are school districts that are like lost a bunch, a lot of their yes. kids. And we just don't know where don't know where they are. I think it's been an equity catastrophe for the reasons that you've identified. And I also agree around the mental health point. Actually one of my son my middle son works he works in childcare, does and working in a summer camp. Um, and he says some of the kids that have come to the camp who he knows from before, he barely recognizes them, you know, just in terms of their mental health issues and just some of their anxiety. That he, and so they've spent the summer camp trying to just rehabilitate. They they, they've been doing rehabilitation. Yeah, this is what actually I've been hearing this from. I have a good friend who runs a summer camp in um, somebody I connected with through the pandemic who runs a summer camp in, in Texas, who basically said like he couldn't believe what people showed like what people showed up with in terms of just both the kids and the counselors like what they've sort of been through in the last year and that like they just basically the summer camp is like rehabilitating like mental health issues um and you know kids have just it's just been a totally different kind of environment yeah i think we're going to be tallying the costs for for some time well um i don't want to take too much more of your time but i do i do want to ask you two two final questions that's okay number sure. one is the phone when to give your kids a phone which you do you do talk about uh in there and it's one of the questions that every kind of parent asks is what's the right age to give my kid a, a phone so what's the what's the evidence-based answer so i i think you know the evidence-based answer is that you know we don't have great evidence um and mm-hmm. and but but it, there, there's, it's a little more specific than that, which is that basically when you think about and – and here we're thinking about like, you know, a phone with Instagram and social media, like the sort of stuff yeah, that a comes with, the, with yeah. the phone, a smartphone. Yes. Um, you know, and I think that the, the, the sort of answer is that like for some kids it's really good and for some kids it's really bad and for most kids it's probably something in the middle. You know, that, that we can sort of – this can be like a, a kind of social lifeline for kids, a, a like way to connect with some of these other peer groups and, and kind of find people that are their, that are their people and that can be good. And then there are kids who get, you know, who sort of for whom this seems to exacerbate anxiety or depression because of, you know, you see stuff and you're not like those people and, and you know, the phone becomes kind of a, a conduit to the things that you're not having. Um, so I think that the the thing about that is that it actually is pretty hard. I think it's probably quite hard to predict what what you know, which space your kid, your kid is going to be in. So when you ask, like, what are the considerations around this? I think, you know, that that is the set of of considerations other than the sort of, like, it costs money, you know, what are the other, like, they could call me, you know, there's like practical reasons to do it or not do it. So there are some things like that. But I think that the, the thing we're all worried about is that. And so when I think about that, that trade off, I think in some ways, the most important part of this kind of decision is having an ability to follow up is this Mm -hmm. kind of last step of sort of how we and and to like to think about phone introduction as a trial Mm -hmm. and and as an explicit trial because the thing is you're probably not if you're worried about some version of this you're kind of not going to know how it goes until you try it Mm -hmm. and that that i that that there is a sort of so when we get to this point with my kids i think the main thing is i am going to say we're going to try it for three months and we are going to see, we are going to explicitly at the end of three months, see, you know, what is, how has it gone? Are there more limits we want? Do we want to stop this altogether? Is this like not good? Do we want to put more limits on it? Do we want to kind of, is it going okay? And I think that's, that feels to me like a much more important thing than exactly, you know, is it 11 or 12 or 13 or or 10 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the last of your F's, I think, that, that which I think is strong, which is the follow-up point and to treat more of these decisions as we've made the decision, but it's, it should be in the spirit of a pilot. Um, because you just don't know how it's going to work. And my last question is, 
what's next? Uh, I mean, one assumes that there's a chronological sequence here. You have the parent data series. And so, um, you know, it's too late for me. My kids are through high school now. So, right. I'm, you're, you know, it's it, over. It's, uh, yes, I need, I need a different book from you. But is it going to carry on along that way? Are you, are you going to keep that series going? I don't. I don't know. You know, I like writing books. I, you know, I think I would be probably not right to say that I won't do another one because, you know, people always do another book. Um, You know, I write a lot from my own experience and my oldest kid is only 10. And so I think that I, I am not, I don't see my way into kind of what is a, what is an interesting take on teenagers. And, you know, I think that, and, and are there pieces of this sort of approach or data that, would be interesting to surface there um so i'm not uh i'm, I'm not sure i don't know well presumably you could do more on covid or, or are you are you, over, are you done do with more COVID, on COVID you know a lot of my research is about food so i've sort of thought mm-hmm. about like you know is there an interesting book about kind of what we know about diet and what we know about food and how we know it and that kind of overlaps with a lot of my interest in in evidence and statistics and how bad it is so that's like another direction well, whatever it is, you have a guaranteed audience, um, for sure, um, given the work you've done uh, so far. And I do think that the blend you bring of humanity, uh, is it uh, you, your description of part memoir, um, part meta-analysis? Part meta-analysis. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a great description. And honestly, I think there's a bit of a thirst for that right now. So um, I found it, even even though my kids are much older, I found it very helpful to, to read your work. I know lots of others too. And again, thank you for your work on COVID. And thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This is great. Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate, and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.